Hello, and welcome to This is USG, a video podcast by the universities at Shady Grove. Nine universities, one campus, great results. I'm Ann Kadimian, Executive Director of the Universities at Shady Grove. The biotechnology and life science industry is, a, is so critical to the economic development of Montgomery County, to the state of Maryland, and to the capital region. And biohealth innovation plays a key role in advancing the industry as it works to translate market relevant research into commercial success by connecting management and funding and markets. Rich Bendis is the founder, president, and CEO of Biohealth Innovation Incorporated. He is a leading expert in the innovation economy with remarkable success as an entrepreneur, as a corporate executive, as an angel investor, investment banker, innovation and technology-based economic development leader, an international speaker and consultant in the technology and healthcare industries. I am delighted and honored to welcome him to This Is USG. Rich, welcome. And thank you very much for the opportunity. It's great to have you here. Rich, I want to start at the beginning, right? You, your, your career is dedicated to innovation, to you know, catalyzing change and, and growing new opportunities. Tell us how you came to innovation as, as, a, as a kind of expertise and you know, what is it about your life journey that brought you to innovation as a focus of your energy and work? Well, you're going to go way back now, Ann. So, uh, you know, I didn't intend to become involved in the innovation economy uh, to the extent that I have, but I think it was serendipitous because as I started my corporate career, I worked for some very innovative companies. And I uh, first was Quaker Oats, which was an uh, innovator in the food industry. Second was uh, Quake, uh, Polaroid. And I had a chance to work with Edwin Land, who was one of the greatest innovators back in that time. And people don't realize it, but when I was with him back in, or with Polaroid back in the, the 60s and early 70s, he had televisions in their laboratory in Cambridge, Massachusetts on the wall 50 years ago or 60 years ago before we actually started seeing him here now. But after that, Texas Instruments, one of the leaders in designing integrated circuits, uh, and as they built their consumer products division, had a chance to interact with all of those engineers, me being more of a marketing and salesperson, uh, got to learn about innovation in the electronics industry, uh, and then really uh, also in the service industry. I had a chance to work for a tremendous entrepreneur in the healthcare nursing business. We had a national uh, 125 offices working with nurses throughout the United States. I Fortunately, I had a chance to become the president of that organization with 10,000 nurses and watch what was going on in innovation in the home health care industry and the nursing industry within the in hospitals. And then ultimately, uh, my first real venture personally was when I went in to become the chairman and CEO of a company called Continental Healthcare Systems. And we developed software for hospitals in the pharmacy and the materials management area had a chance to work with 100 uh, great uh, computer science software developers uh, and service people. Uh, me being a non-technologist, got exposed to innovation in that area. And one of the things I learned there, Ann, was it takes twice as much money and twice as much time to complete innovative software products as, uh, as you think it's going to be. So great learning experience. And then my innovation in the uh, in really the pharma industry came with Marion Laboratories, uh, which was acquired by Merrill Dow and then became Quintiles. And, you know, as they all go through many iterations, I had a chance to work for a very innovative CEO, Ewing Marion Kaufman. And Mr. Kaufman, uh, you might know the name because the Kaufman Foundation or the Entrepreneurial Foundation is the largest entrepreneurial foundation in the world. So got exposed to innovation and entrepreneurship through Marion Laboratories. And so I really had the great opportunity of having fantastic mentors that I was exposed to early in my corporate career before I actually started to venture into my own entrepreneurial and innovative career myself. Well, it's, it's fascinating. I mean, the thread of innovation, the thread of entrepreneurship, the thread of being on the on the cutting edge of change in all these different industries is really interesting. and. Um, what a what a fascinating path you've taken. Before we talk about the creation of biohealth innovation, I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about 
why the biohealth industry is so important here. Give us a snapshot. What is it that we're what is it that that we're we're trying to grow here? What is it? What what are the opportunities and the possibilities here for the region? Sure, I think the the key to first of all, biohealth term didn't exist eleven years ago, mm-hmm. and uh, and we'll talk about the evolution of BA biohealth innovation later. But one of the things that we noticed back then was the convergence of ha- what was happening between technology and healthcare and the pharma and the medical device industry. So. I think uh, what we have is a very unique region. When you look at Northern Virginia, which and the Beltway Bandits down there and how AOL was founded and how important the information technology industry has been down there. And then you look over here in Montgomery County where we had Metamune and Human Genome Sciences, which were two pioneers in the biotechnology industry. And those things helped propel this industry to, get, to become known nationally and internationally in the individual strengths of the bio industry and sort of the technology industry, uh, which has really come to merge to where uh, this, what we call the biohealth capital region now, which that brand didn't exist uh, six years ago, which we helped brand with AstraZeneca and Metamune, uh, which we refer to as Maryland, DC and Virginia, uh, has some unbelievable assets that other regions in the United States and the world really cannot compete with. And we start with the National Institute of Health, uh, which has 27 uh, individual research institutes located in Montgomery County and Bethesda with 4,000, I mean, 6,000 scientists that focus on intramural research and a $4 billion annual budget, which is the largest basic research budget that exists anywhere in the world. You, you also have the Food and Drug Administration headquartered right here in Montgomery County. Uh, so if you wanna get anything regulated within medical devices or pharmaceuticals, it has to go through the FDA in our backyard. The other thing that's unique, and I'll stay with the government entities for, for the time being, the CMS, Center for Medicaid Services, uh, located in Baltimore. So if you wanna do research, you go to NIH, you wanna get it regulated, you go to FDA. And if you wanna get it priced for Medicare and Medicaid, uh, people, uh, recipients throughout the whole United States, it's got to go through CMS in Baltimore. And then of course, uh, with the, the policy standpoint, HHS in Washington, D.C. is the largest public body focused on health and human services in the world. So from a government perspective, we have uh, unreproducible assets with those entities. And then from an academic standpoint, you have Johns Hopkins and the University System of Maryland combined which both do about $3.7 billion of research annually uh, just in this region. And that's pretty exciting uh, when you think we have two of the leading academic institutions uh, from a research perspective in our backyard. And then in addition to that, uh, in the biohealth capital region, we have 2,300 biohealth and life science companies. So that means that we have an extremely strong cluster of uh, industry participants uh, that uh, are leading this biohealth industry. On top of that, we basically have the highest and most educated uh, level of PhDs uh, of any region in the United States located in our backyard. So from an academic perspective, we train, educate, and employ more PhDs than any other region so that our talent pool is fantastic. We're one of the top patent producing regions in the United States in the life sciences. We have uh, approximately 30 million square feet of wet lab space, which is required to have, uh, in order you're gonna build a a life science industry, you have to have the facilities to be able to support it. And then our venture capital industry is growing dramatically. And so when you put all of those elements together, it makes our biohealth capital region right now the fourth largest biopharma cluster in the US. And we aim to be number three by 2023. And we don't wanna hope to stop there. Yeah, an amazing, an amazing collection of assets and possibilities and opportunities. Uh, You laid out all the government agencies that are relevant here, all of the investors here, everything. So let's talk about where biohealth innovation fits into all of this. You know, we're number four now, uh, aiming to be number three. 
you know, it sounds like there's the potential to be number one and, and rocketing beyond. Tell us what the role of biohealth innovation is. How does biohealth innovation bring all these assets together um, and, you know, see, see what would take us to number three and maybe to number one as well? Yeah, I think that's a great question, Anne. And, and really, from an evolution standpoint, biohealth innovation, of course, uh, did not exist uh, 10 years ago. And it was the vision to, uh, of one of the uh, county executives, Ike Leggett, uh, uh, prior to our current uh, county executive, that said, we have all of these assets in our backyards. How come we're not getting a greater return on investment? And that means jobs, companies, taxes from all of these assets we had. And uh, so to, how I got engaged was I was actually making a speech down at the National Academy of Science on biotech, uh, bio uh, clusters around the world and what are the elements that are necessary to grow a bio cluster. And somebody from Johns Hopkins was there and said, we've been talking about doing this for many years. We, we have all of the ingredients, but we haven't been able to put it together. Will you come up and talk to us? So that's how I got engaged in this region. And uh, in doing so, we found a couple things that uh, needed some work. Number one, industry was not engaged. Uh, the, the region was known as a government region and an academic region, but not really known as a venture capital entrepreneurial or an industry commercialization region to find a way to get industry engaged. Uh, and, and basically, second of all, none of the organizations that focused on economic development were what you'd classify industry-led and market-driven and were heavily supported by industry. Generally, all of the organizations were funded or funded by government and supported by government. So we needed more of a direct connection to industry. And, and thirdly, there really wasn't a long-term commitment to building the bio-innovation economy in this region. Everybody was somewhat siloed and they weren't sort of working together in a team environment. So uh, biohealth innovation was conceived to be an innovation intermediary to help connect academia, government, non-governmental organizations, uh, entrepreneurs, investment bankers, venture capitalists to all come together to work together. And BHI didn't have to control anything. It just had to be able to understand where the assets were that could be connected to those in need. And that was sort of the evolution of biohealth innovation. And we have an unbelievable board of directors, uh, which is made up of 95% uh, industry participants from uh, corporations, uh, service providers. But we only have two academics on our board, one, the president of Johns Hopkins and the chancellor, Jay Perman, uh, who you know well your ultimate boss, uh, who's also uh, on our board of directors, but we don't have anybody from government. So, and so it's really an industry and a market driven organization that tries to understand what the needs are of the emerging and existing biohealth companies. What are the things that they are lacking in order to continue to grow and how can BHI help stimulate them by connecting them or providing them resources that they may not have access to? Yeah, that's terrific. What a what a great idea. What a great way to connect all the dots in such a in such a helpful uh, way. Can you tell us, Rich, a little bit about who are some of the companies that you've helped, or the kinds of companies that that you've helped in this process? You know, the possibilities seem limitless in terms of the type of companies that come out of this. The the breadth of life science companies, add in all different kinds of technologies to that. Um, tell us a bit about the kinds of companies that, that biohealth innovation has worked with or, or helped. Well, I guess from the standpoint of, uh, I guess, helped, we could say partnered with. In, partnered. In, there you go. That's a better word. Yeah, yeah, because it's in some respects, they're much larger than we are. And one of those has been really the anchor within our region, and that's Metamune, which was acquired by AstraZeneca. And about seven years, six, seven years ago, they really wanted to develop a greater culture in this region and, and why would big industry be interested in things like a biohealth innovation? Number one, they need access to talent. Number two, they need access to uh, new products, new technologies, new entrepreneurs. Number three, they're, they're interested in doing acquisitions and strategic partnerships with people within the industry. And it's hard for big companies to interact with small companies. Sometimes you need intermediaries. And the other thing, the stronger the recognition our region has, 
the better it is for them to recruit, whether it's companies or people, and retain them within our in our region. The other thing is, you know, if we can grow this region, you have a cluster effect. And one of the challenges for larger corporations and even small ones, if you're trying to attract talent here, and uh, if the, the reason they come here fails and there's no place else to go, then it's very difficult. Then you have to uproot your family and go somewhere else. So. Uh, at the end of the day, you'd like to find a cluster of like companies working together so that you have the ability to stay in a region as you're trying to grow your family. So that's one instance. And another one with them was they had a number of assets in their pipeline, which they were not going to commercialize, which they invested millions of dollars in. They decided to spin out uh, these assets into a new company called Viela Bio. And Viela Bio spun out about uh, three years ago. Uh, most of the people came internally from uh, the uh, MetaMune at that time, uh, we provided a little bit of guidance on what kind of entrepreneurial resources are needed to, create, uh, to spin out a company as a startup. They were a, a non-traditional startup because they started uh, with probably 25 people, but they had $250 million they raised in their initial financing, uh, did a second financing, then they went public well, less than 18 months, and then they were acquired within three years. So that's a very unusual success story. But more importantly, that company now that uh, acquired them has stayed in the region and is continuing to grow within the region uh, and will continue to develop with those people. Smaller companies that we've been associated with, some really neat companies, Miracule, uh, Oncology Company, Anthony Sala was a uh, scientist at the National Cancer Institute. He wanted to get entrepreneurial experience. We brought him in as a part-time fellow at BioHealth Innovation. He actually ended up being a managing director of a company from the Netherlands that we helped create a subsidiary in Montgomery County. Uh, and they were an organ on a chip company. Uh, they're in Gaithersburg. Uh, they have grown now to where uh, both entities in Maryland and the Netherlands have over 100 people. Anthony played a major role in their attraction and their management to get that, get and keep them here. And then while, while he was doing that, he also, you have to be about a year away from uh, NIH to be able to license technologies if you worked on something at the National Institute of Health. So while he was doing that with Mimetis, he created a company called Miracle, which is an oncology company based on the science he worked with, with one of the leading researchers, at the National Cancer Institute. BHI helped in the formation of that company. And one of the other things that has been happened with both of these companies you've been associated with, we've helped them raise non-dilutive funding. That's small business innovation research grant funding, which goes in to help do early stage research in young companies, which they traditionally can't afford. And so uh, that's a very important tool. We have all of these SBIR program managers located in our backyard, but in the past, we were not, uh, there wasn't a tool to help small businesses have competitive proposals they would submit to get funding. So we work with over 180 companies now, uh, over 50% of them have been successful in raising non-dilutive funding where the national average is about 20%. And that comes from building great rapport with the uh, program managers at the different institutes here in, the, uh, in, in this region with the luxury of having them all in our backyard. And you know, there's a, another company that's really, we didn't help to a great degree, but it's a new success story from the University of Maryland and College Park is IonQ. IonQ is uh, the first publicly traded pure quantum computing company, which is a spin out out of the University of Maryland. And, uh, you know, they came out with a $2 billion valuation as, as a startup. Can you imagine that? That's, a, you know, they talk about unicorns over a billion dollar value. And we have our own unicorns in our backyard. And it's nice to see them emerge from the academic uh, institutions that uh, help develop them. And so that's a really neat success story, which leads us to what the theme is of our new, our next biohealth capital uh, conference, our seventh leading or se seventh forum that we're going to have. Uh, and it's called Big Bio and Big Data Converging Together. And so when we talked about technology and life sciences and how they are converging, that's going to be the theme of this meeting, uh, which will be September 13th and 14th. IonQ is going to be one of our keynote speakers there. 
a number of other university system of Maryland people will be involved in that forum. So we have really close ties to the university. And, and one of the things we've talked about is uh, USG and BHI developing closer ties in the future. That's right. And I want to talk with you a little bit more about that. I just want to say how exciting it is to hear you kind of map out this ecosystem and all the all the components that are essential for success for small companies and large companies and the really um, fascinating role that BHI plays in that is terrific. I'm glad you brought up quantum. Um, I, that was going to be one of my questions for you is just thinking about I know there's going to be a whole forum on this coming coming up and USG is excited about that as well. But um, what do you see as the possibilities of quantum being introduced into the life sciences? Where do you see the the big changes? What you know? What are the possibilities? I know it's I know it's a it'll be a massive impact on the industry, um, and we don't even know the potentials yet of of quantum. But where do you see the most interesting possibilities um, in terms of the quantum introduction to the life sciences? I think it's really exciting. It's really uh, we can't just talk about quantum without talking about artificial intelligence and machine learning because they all sort of come together. And I'll give you three quick examples. Uh, I think one is in drug discovery. We have a company in Bethesda called Gain Therapeutics, if, which has a U.S. headquarters here, but it also has operations in Switzerland and Spain. Uh, in Switzerland and Spain, they have access to quantum computers, uh, which are extremely expensive, very hard to get access to. They're using it in drug discovery. There are certain elements of your clinical trials before you get into human clinical trials, which can be simulated on quantum computers much faster and much more cost effectively than having to do everything in laboratories. And uh, that simulation is enabling, I think will enable uh, drug discovery in the future to be much more cost effective and much more expeditious. Another company we have in our backyard is the Emmes Corporation, E-M-M-E-S. Uh, and Emmes is a clinical research organization. Uh, they are using uh, AI and machine learning uh, and potentially will be getting into the quantum computing as they work in uh, supporting companies with clinical trials throughout the world. And they've worked with a thousand companies throughout the world. They're one of the fastest growing companies in our biohealth capital region. And we see that uh, the, the data is unbelievably important from a tracking and a capturing standpoint for clinical trials. And the AI and machine learning uh, enables you to do that much more effectively. Last one I'll talk about is a company called Vibrant Health located in Northern Virginia. And uh, they've gotten a contra contract with the National Institute of Health to develop the DNA mapping for a million US citizens. And that mapping and that gene pool that they will have data collected for and managed will be accessible to all of the pharma, bio, medical device companies to be able to access as they're looking at developing clinical trial information or getting demographic information on patients or citizens around the United States as they get into development of new technologies. So, you know, we, we have companies that are very rich in the AI machine learning and the quantum area. And uh, we're going to see more and more companies. Of course, the big pharma, AstraZeneca, GSK, Novavax, and all of those will be uh, in, uh, utilizing this or are already using, uh, utilizing it now. But the question is, how can you find access for the smaller companies who actually compete with the larger companies and don't have access to those resources? And I think some shared facilities will be opening to where quantum computing will be available to some of the smaller emerging companies as well. Yeah, it's very exciting, both for the the time to market and the the you know more efficient management of things, but just the possibilities for innovation. And you know, I think I've heard Jeff Galvin say that some of the innovations in gene therapy, for example, are going to you know make uh, make uh, chemotherapy and radiation and cancer treatment, for example, go the way of leeches and bloodletting. Right. So that the things <laughs> the things that we the things that we see as you know is kind of cutting edge now will. You know, just be transformed. I think by the possibilities of of this uh, this marriage, if you will, between the quantum world and the and the life sciences world. Well, USG is in the midst of our we're planning for our, our we're doing our first strategic plan, um, and we're very excited about it. Thinking about our future and really focusing on the life sciences and growing our contributions to the life sciences. And 
I'm thinking about the talent development and, and how we bring more programs here, a wider range of programs, how we broaden the pathways into the life sciences. Uh, what, what do you see as the possibilities? What, what, what do you think are some of the things we should be focusing on from your perch there at BHI and, and looking to USG as a partner um, in this talent development effort? Where do you see some of the priorities that you think we should be focusing on as, as a partner in this effort? Thanks for calling it a perch. Uh, you know. <laughs> You're, you're doing this with Big Bird now, so uh, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I, I think uh, you know one of the luxuries you have, as you mentioned, USG's affiliated with nine academic institutions, all having their own strengths. So uh, I think as the needs are identified within the biohealth uh, industry, you're going to be well positioned to be able to develop uh, curriculum and specialized programming. Uh, to help support the growing needs of our region. So I, I think the talent development is one of the key areas that I think you're going to have a major role in. And, you know, right now, uh, our region is growing uh, leaps and bounds. And, you know, a lot of people don't know it, but with warp speed, the money that came from BARDA to help fund the development of vaccines, therapeutics, and diagnostics to help treat COVID-19, 40% of that $16 billion came into one county in the United States, Montgomery County, Maryland, into AstraZeneca and GSK and Novavax and Emergent. And so what what's enabling them to do is that they're growing rapidly. They all need talent uh, and they're, they're trying to, they all need uh, new facilities. So uh, I think one of the roles you're gonna be able to play is that we need to grow the talent pool because there's only so many people available to be able to provide those needs today. And we can attract some of them, but I think we have to develop our own talent. And uh, everybody that, uh, that they're hiring right now does not have to have a PhD or a master's in order to participate in the biohealth industry. I see uh, all the way from Montgomery College, USG, all the way up into you know, the system and the University of Maryland and College Park, there's a con continuity that can be developed in that education and training to prepare people if there's a close working relationship with industry to identify what their needs are. So if they try to do it by themselves or you try to do it by yourself, there's a disconnect. But I think the more their interaction there is between industry and the academic institutions like USG, we're gonna be able to meet those uh, workforce training needs much more efficiently and much more quickly in the future. And if you, once you throw quantum and data and AI and machine learning in with everything with the, the bio industry and medical devices and biomarkers and tools, it gets a little more complex where people have to have diversified skill sets uh, rather than just be totally specialized in one. And I think, that's another thing with your disciplines you have at USG, by having nine academic institutions all with their own strengths, you're going to be able to maybe develop some of that custom programming very efficiently. You know, listening to your great response there, I'm, I'm thinking that some of, the, some of the similarities in the approach we're taking to the way BHI operates and why our partnership is so important, one is you're really focused on keep you know growing talent here and keeping talent here so that's a really big point of emphasis in bhi as well and it's something that's really important for usg that we draw from the county develop people in the county and have people stay here in the county so community wealth building really you know keeping keeping the wealth keeping the talent keeping the energy here in the county and then the other piece that really stands out in your response that really resonates with me is that and doing it collaboratively you know seeing that all the all the partners have to come together to do this that we can't realize these possibilities in any kind of a top down way that it has to be done very collaboratively and and, and across across the board um, so thank you for sharing that. I, you mentioned COVID-19, and I'm, I'm wondering if you could reflect a little bit more the amount of money that has come into Montgomery County, into the, into the industry in response to COVID has been tremendous. Um, you know, in addition to the investments that are being made here, how, how do you see, um, through, through your BHI lens, how do you see COVID and the response to COVID changing the industry? What, what do you think is the, is the long-term impact of the response to COVID for the industry? Well, I think one of the first things uh, that we noticed was there were a, small, a number of small companies and large companies 
that really were not heavy into the vaccine diagnostic uh, or the therapeutic development around looking at these diseases that uh, emerged very quickly. But what we found were a number of companies that became very nimble uh, when they had the call for proposals and the funding was available by the federal government. There was another number of companies, small and large, that were able to pivot and actually Novavax, which is one of the greatest recipients and one of the greatest responders, took uh, some old technology that they had focused on before that was not really in the mainstream for what they were uh, focused on today. They were able to dust it off and then reapply it towards the COVID-19 uh, pandemic and the development of their vaccine. And they've made tremendous progress uh, and it shows a company about 14 or 15 months ago that was almost dead. Uh, you know, their stock trading around a dollar, uh, which I, I think you and I both wish that we had bought uh, a few shares back then uh, because the stock has traded as high as $130, $140 today. I mean, it, it really what that comes down to is effective management. And, you know, it basically says if you have good talent in your company, you are, uh, understand what the market needs are, and you are able to become nimble, uh, then you can be responsive. But, you know, we had over $7 billion come into Montgomery County and uh, into large companies as well as small companies. Another thing that happened for the state of Maryland was uh, Department of Defense uh, wanted a rapid COVID-19 test. They found one over in Australia. And um, the company in Australia is called Elume, E-L-L-U-M-E. They got a $230 million grant uh, uh, to, and the grant was dependent on them establishing a facility in the United States to manufacture and distribute this COVID-19 home test, which would be made available to Americans. And uh, so what they did was a national search for locations in the uh, United States to build their facility. And they made a decision to come to Frederick, Maryland, which is right up the road. And they're going to have 200,000 square feet. They're going to hire 1,500 people. The president for the U.S. operation came, his name is Jeff Boyle, came from Kyogen uh, here in our backyard in Montgomery County. And the head of business development came from Emergent. So you know that they're going to have a tremendous local influence here. And that's the type of a company that uh, based on what's going on with education today, they don't have to be located right in Montgomery County for USG to service them. You can develop pr proprietary uh, curriculum for them, which in Frederick is 35 miles away, uh, not a big deal based on the way education's evolving today. So you know, that's another, uh, we were a major recipient uh, because of the talent that existed here and the affordability. And one of the reasons they selected this compared to San Francisco, New York, and Boston, were one third the cost for wet lab space here. Uh, and But the quality of the employees that you recruit here are somewhat on a, a par with anything you'd find anywhere place else in the country. So you can build a quality organization much more cost effectively and be much more nimble here in our biohealth capital region than you would be in those mega markets that are number one, two, and three right now, which we hope to bypass. Yeah, there's a real benefit to the youthfulness of a market or the, the emergent quality to a market that can be so responsive. Um, Rich, I'm going to I'm going to ask a, a final question to get you to reflect a little bit, of, a bit on entrepreneurship. We at USG, another another area that we're really focused on is our lab for entrepreneurship and transformational leadership. And we really believe in the power of social entrepreneurship, the power of just the entrepreneurial mindset to you know solve problems and um, you know, you've you spent a good portion of your career as an entrepreneur and and, you know, the work that you're doing in BHI really it requires a, an entrepreneurial mindset to create it. And you work with entrepreneurs all day long. Um, you know, where where do you think we are in, in terms of, you know, the skills of entrepreneurs and what's needed there? What when we talk about someone being an entrepreneur, or a good entrepreneur, what 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 do you, what does that mean? What do, what are you looking for? What are the qualities? And you know, what are the things that we ought to be encouraging in education to encourage students? We're at this moment, this transformational moment in history of coming out of COVID, or at least learning how to manage COVID, um, but all of the gaps and all of the challenges and the changes in the economy that we're facing, you know, we need people who are able to solve problems across the board in so many areas. 
what do you see as some of the key qualities or elements of an entrepreneurial mindset that people need going in not only into the life sciences but into this broader um, set of challenges that we're facing right a great question and since i've been exposed to so many great entrepreneurs i've learned a little bit from each one of them and you know one of the uh, mr coffin we talked about uh the coffin foundation he had a philosophy of those who share uh, or produce should share in the reward so any entrepreneur can't do it by themselves they have to build a quality team and when you're talking about a quality team the quality of the team is only as good as far as your shadow will reach mm -hmm means if you don't can't touch other people that can do things you can't do and everything is dependent on you then you're really not going to be able to build that uh, homogeneous team you need to have so you know first of all the the entrepreneur has to understand it takes a team of qualified people to come together to build a, a winning formula for success uh you can't worry about being in control you have to worry about shared responsibilities uh, and understand your strengths of what you're good at and what you're not, not good at and find ways to, uh, you know, add value to your weaknesses by the attraction of other people. Uh, the other thing is, you know, uh, communication skills in both ways. Number one, an entrepreneur has to be a very good listener. I think they have to be able to be a very good listener before they can be a good communicator. Because as you and I are talking right now, if I didn't listen to what your question was, I'll, I basically would just be talking to whatever I felt needed to be said, rather than trying to address you uh, and what you're, uh, you're looking for from a response from me. So I think listening skills are unbelievably important uh, because entrepreneurs have to understand what the, the customer needs, what the market needs are. And if they don't listen extremely well, then they're gonna miss that boat. Um, you know, there's probably many other qualities and attributes that uh, entrepreneurs need to have, but we're in the process of training five South Korean companies on entrepreneurship and how to enter the U.S. market right now in our contract we have. And it's somewhat related to, we put a 20-week curriculum together, Anne. And one of the most important things we did for them was assign a mentor to them. Uh, and each one of them has a mentor that we thought fit sort of their business profile and where they were sort of in the evolution of their business. So marrying uh, entrepreneurs with mentors, I think, is extremely important. When uh, you, you're forming your early stage company, everybody thinks about a board of directors, but really what you need is a board of advisors. That, and that board of advisors has skill sets that you don't have personally. Uh, and, you know, one of the things that entrepreneurs are afraid of is asking people to help them or to serve on an advisory board. A lot of people are flattered to be asked. And, you know, it, it's just that entrepreneurs somewhat are intimidated going to uh, ask someone to be an advisor to them. And I basically think they need to shoot for the moon. Get the smartest, brightest, biggest dog that you can find in town to ask them to be an advisor. Surprisingly, half the time they're going to get them to say yes. So I think having those mentors that go side by side uh, with you uh, through your entrepreneurial journey is important because I, I had one mentor. He was on my board of directors when I was running a public company. He called me every Friday night about five o'clock. He didn't want to know what I did well. He said, Rich, what are you losing sleep over tonight? So every Friday night, it was, what did we rehash? It wasn't what was going well. It was, he can't help me, though, unless I communicate with him on where I need the help. So that was his way of saying, I understand the company's doing okay, but there's areas where I can be of service to you. If you don't tell me what you, what you need help in, I can't be of service to you. So I guess uh, there are little nuggets that I've had the benefit of learning from different people I've been associated with. And I think that's one of the entrepreneurial traits is, you know, surround yourself with smart people who have been there and done it before. Uh, learn a little bit that you can apply in what you're trying to do in your life goals as you're trying to build your entrepreneurial dream and you'll be more successful. It's great insight and great advice, especially as we tackle the challenges ahead. Rich, thank you so much. This has been a great conversation. Uh, best wishes for a successful forum coming up. And uh, USG is thrilled to be uh, a partner working with BHI. So thank you so much. Thank you, Anne. And uh, anything we can do to help you with your strategic plan, but more important, the implementation of that strategic plan, we're here to help.
we'll we'll have you on speed dial. <laughs> It'll be great. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks.